Hi guys, welcome. Welcome to News in 30 Minutes. I know everyone is in the festive mode, but you have to always read newspapers. Newspapers do not have holidays and so does the current affairs. So always keep updating yourself. So today on the 23rd of October 2020, let us look at some of the important issues of the day. The first issue that you're seeing is what ails the biggest health cover? Okay, so here the article is mainly talking about the performance report, the 11th performance report 2023 submitted by Comptroller and Auditor General of India. Okay, and this report is mainly talking about Ayushman Bharat. Okay, it is mainly talking about Ayushman Bharat. So before we talk about what are the loopholes that are present in Ayushman Bharat, you have to learn about this program a little bit in depth because it can be asked both in your prelims as well as your main exams. So you have to know about this Ayushman Bharat. So what is Ayushman Bharat? Okay, so you have Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana. Okay, that is PMJAY. Okay, now this Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana has two components. One is the health and wellness center, and the second is Ayushman Bharat. Okay, so this health and wellness center is mainly to do with primary health care, whereas Ayushman Bharat is mainly to do with secondary as well as tertiary health care. Okay, so that is the difference. Health and wellness center are mainly to do with primary health care and secondary and tertiary health care are to do with this. Uh, I'm sorry, the Ayushman Bharat is to do with secondary and tertiary hospitalization. Okay, so to go a little bit in depth about Ayushman Bharat, because this report concerns with respect to Ayushman Bharat, the beneficiaries of Ayushman Bharat are almost 107 million people. That is almost 10 crore population. The next is it provides an health insurance cover. The Aishman Bharat provides health insurance cover of 5 lakhs per family per year. Okay, so this is the insurance cover provided by Aishman Bharat. The next is the beneficiaries. There is a database that is set up that is known as beneficiaries identification database okay so this beneficiary identification database this is where the beneficiaries have to get registered once they get registered they get what you call as a uh, pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana id they get an id and this id is a nine digit okay it is a nine digit alpha numeric it is a nine digit alpha numeric code okay it's a nine digit alphanumeric code okay now along with this this is the this is what is the uh, ayushman bharat scheme basically it is an insurance cover that provides five lakh per family per year for the hospitalization secondary and tertiary health care so this is what is ayushman bharat okay now one other information that you should know is this pradhan mantri jan Haroge yojana tells that a beneficiary has to register with the use of Aadhaar card okay now if the beneficiary does not have Aadhaar card for the first time the beneficiary can use other identity cards to use the treatment but the second time they have to file the Aadhaar card and get it registered as soon as possible so the second treatment will not be possible unless you have a Aadhaar card only the first treatment is allowed without the Aadhaar card if in case of some other uh, reasons so exception is only for the first treatment so this you should have in mind okay now these are the subtle details that UPSC will ask in your prelims exam so just by knowing the basic surface level of Ayushman Bharat will not do now you should have some amount of depth in whatever programs you learn because UPSC questions are coming from the depth okay so this is how you have to learn about the program so this is about Jan Arogya Yojana within which you have health and wellness center as well as Ayushman Bharat okay so this program was assessed by the uh, you know comptroller and editor auditor general of india the cag report now let us see what are the challenges that the you know the institution has come out with 
these are some of the challenges uh, that the performance report, report of CAG has highlighted. The first is uh, some states are using their own databases. That is not wrong. The Ayushman Bharat itself, it allows use of databases, state databases. Okay, it allows the use of state databases. One information that I left out there is in Ayushman Bharat, what is the criteria to recognize the beneficiaries? The criteria is socio-economic caste census. So all those uh, people who come under the socio-economic caste census, those people are the beneficiaries uh, who are eligible for Ayushman Bharat. Okay, so what is the condition? You either have the central database that is the beneficiary identification database given by the central government or you the states are also allowed to use their own databases. The reason is because health is a state subject, correct? So they are allowed to use their own databases. However, what is the conditionality is the conditionality is though they use their databases, all those beneficiaries identified via SECC must be included. This is the condition. States can use their databases as health is a state subject. Okay. However, the beneficiaries via SECC who are identified, the socio-economic cash census who are identified must be included even in the state databases. This is not being done. Okay. This is not yet done. All the beneficiaries identified by a socio-economic cash census is not being done on those states which are using their own databases. That is the first problem. The next is, as I told you, Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana ID is a nine digit alphanumeric number. But what the problem is, the problem is they are not getting unique. There are a lot of IDs that are replicated and this replication will increase redundancies. Okay, this is the problem of the ID. The ID should always be unique nine digit, but this nine digit is actually not unique in some cases. There are many beneficiaries getting the same ID. That is the second problem. The third problem is the definition of family. This guidelines of Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana does not define what is a family. Okay, now if we take other programs like the central government health scheme, or if we take employees state insurance corporation scheme okay so if you take central government health scheme or employees state go uh, you know state insurance corporation scheme these programs are mentioning or defining what exactly is a family but this particular uh, you know program does not define what is a family it is important to define family because per family per year you are going to get a cover of 5 lakhs so you should know what exactly is the definition of family the next is if you don't define family you are not defining family size now look what is the problem the family size that is registering under this program is varying from 11 members to 201 members. Now this shows that 201 members in one family though is theoretically possible but it is actually unrealistic when it comes to the real world scenario. Okay, so this is what is the uh, problem another problem. The next is the case of Tamil Nadu here the CAG report points out the erroneous Uh, or multiple beneficiaries on single Aadhaar card. That is, since Aadhaar, though first time there is an exception, Aadhaar has to be used for the registration of a beneficiary. There is multiple beneficiaries on a single Aadhaar or there are few beneficiaries that are, you know, registered on erroneous Aadhaar. So, this is a case of Tamil Nadu. And the last is mobile number. A lot of beneficiaries are registering with wrong or invalid numbers okay so these are the six challenges that are highlighted by the CAG report as you know Pradhan Manchi Jan Arogya Yojana is a very significant step for India to move towards universalization of healthcare if we have to create a universalized healthcare to make sure that right to health is truly realized as a fundamental right this program has to have a flawless execution and for that flawless execution we need to plug all these loopholes 
So this is the first issue that is mainly talking about the Ayushman Bharat, which is the component of Pradhan Mantri Jin Arogya Yojana. As you know, since health is a state subject, this Pradhan Mantri Jin Arogya Yojana is a centrally sponsored scheme where the central government provides 60% of the benefits and the 40% contribution comes from the state government. This is in all of India except Northeast India. Okay, so this is the first issue of the day. The second issue of the day is cyclonic storms brewing in Arabian Sea as well as Bay of Bengal. Okay, see there is cyclonic storms that are coming up both in Arabian Sea as well as Bay of Bengal. Now just observe these words. Okay, I'll just highlight them a little bit. In a rare weather scenario, there is twin cyclonic storm. It is rare twin cyclonic storms that are brewing in Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. And the cyclonic storm Tej has started already in Arabian Sea. This would be the second cyclonic storm in Arabian Sea this year. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about Arabian Sea, what is happening there and what is that recent phenomena in Arabian Sea. Then we will come to the Bay of Bengal. In Bay of Bengal, this cyclone Amun is still in premature stage. What do you mean by this premature stage? You should know this. So we will concentrate on this as well. Okay, so overall this according to IMD cyclone Tej will move or intensify towards Yemen or Oman coast. Okay, so let us first decipher what the cyclone is. I mean what this article is talking about and then give, go into the technicalities of what the cyclonic storms are. Okay, so first if we have to uh, let me just uh, draw this diagram. Okay, so I hope you can visualize the Arabian Sea as well as Bay of Bengal. Okay, so this is the Arabian Sea. I'm sorry, this uh, as you can see, this is the Arabian Sea and this is the Bay of Bengal. Okay, so in a rare scenario, what the article is telling is there are cyclones that are brewing in Arabian Sea as well as in Bay of Bengal. Okay, so this uh, cyclone Tej. This is the cyclone Tej. This cyclone Tej is going to move towards Oman and Yemen. Okay, it is going to go towards Yemen and Oman. This is Yemen and this is Oman. Okay, and next the Bay of Bengal, the cyclonic storm is still in a premature stage. When they say premature stage, it is it means that they are still depressions and they are not still termed as cyclones. So once the depressions evolve, then we call it as cyclones. And then this cyclone will be given the name Amun. Okay, so this is still in a uh, you know a premature stage, hence they are called as depressions. Okay, so this is what the article is telling. Now let me just decipher this. One is what is exactly a cyclone? When do we call something as a cyclone? See, when do they call cyclone? Cyclones are one, they are low pressure meteorological system they are low pressure meteorological system that is the first point the second point is they have circular isobars okay and the third is they are rotating systems the third is they are rotating systems okay so uh, this is how they look See, this is how they are circular isobars and they themselves are rotating. Now this you should know, they are rotating systems which rotate in anti-clockwise in northern hemisphere and they rotate in clockwise in southern hemisphere. Okay, so this is the definition of cyclone. We cannot get into the technicalities of it, but this is what is the definition of cyclone. They are circular isobars, they are rotating systems and they have a low pressure at the center. Okay, see at this center there is low pressure. Okay, now once you understood what is cyclone, then what is depression? Okay, see on the basis of wind speed. Now if there is low pressure, okay, and there are winds that are rotating this low pressure, now these winds that are rotating uh, in this around this low pressure, these winds will start from a very slow speed and from that slow speed they start intensifying. Okay, so it starts as just one vortex. Okay, now this vortex as it 
takes more and more more and more wind speed okay this vortex will evolve to become a depression and this depression as it increases in its wind speed will go on to become a cyclone okay now you may you can ask why is it uh, you know increasing in its wind speed now the power for it to rotate comes from latent heat of condensation okay the power for the cyclones to rotate comes from latent heat of condensation okay that is the more and more you supply water vapor the more and more water vapor that you supply the greater will be the energy for these rotating systems okay so when the vortex plural is vortices when the vortex is pushed towards warmer parts of the ocean warmer oceans more water vapor is available so that will be able to grasp more and more water vapor it will condense that water vapor and the heat from that condensation is used to rotate the system so the more and more the water vapor the more greater the system okay so from vortex it becomes a depression from depression it becomes a cyclone okay so if that system has to grow it will grow one in size and two in wind speed okay so the greater the speed the greater the water vapor okay so from vortex it will evolve into a depression from depression it will evolve into a cyclone only condition is from vortex if it has to evolve into a depression it has to be pushed to the warmer sides of the ocean and from depression if it has to evolve it has to again be pushed to the warmer side of the ocean so whenever you are pushing it to the warmer side of the ocean it grasps more and more water vapor that water vapor is condensed to create heat and that heat is what will rotate the system and this rotational system will grow in size and increase in wind speed I hope you understood this. So, what they are trying to tell is, in this Bay of Bengal, there are still depression. Now, this depression will evolve into becoming a cyclone when it moves towards the warmer parts. That is what is the meaning. Okay. Now, there is uh, one other classification that you should know. This numbers are not important, but you should just have an idea of this. Now, the depressions. Uh, see, there is different different classification. The depression. There is deep depression. Okay, and then there is a cyclonic storm. Okay, then there is severe cyclonic storm. Then there is very severe cyclonic storm. Okay, then there is extremely severe cyclonic storm. And then the last is super cyclone. Okay, so these are all different. Uh, you know classification of uh, you know rotating wind with low pressure at the center that is the you know the crux of what is a cyclone a cyclone a depression or a vortex is nothing but a low pressure center and winds that are rotating around this low pressure center now how do i define what are these classification this definition is done on the basis of wind speed okay so whenever the wind speed is 31 to 41 km per hour then you call it as depression whenever it extends from sorry 31 to 49 is km per hour is uh, depression when it moves from 50 to 61 it is known as deep depression now this is the premature stage okay so from premature if it has to mature the wind speed has to increase from 62 to 88 km per hour the moment it goes from 62 to 88 kilometers per hour, this is known as cyclonic storm. So, once whatever is happening in Bay of Bengal, that rotation of winds are still in premature stage. Once they get the speed of 61 to 88, then they are going to call it as cyclonic storm and they are going to give the name as Amun. Okay. Now, Tej that has developed in Arabian Sea has already reached the status of extremely severe cyclonic storm. This is Tej in Arabian Sea okay now what is this extremely severe cyclonic storm let us look now this classification as you know is based on the wind speed right so it is 62 to 88 kilometers per hour next is uh, 90 to 115 115 to 125 140 to 220 and this is greater than 220 kilometers per hour okay so overall roughly this is how the classification of any rotating winds around a low pressure point is created okay depression anything lower than this anything lower than 30 kilometers per hour is known as a vortex okay less than 30 kilometers per hour is known as a vortex okay so depression to evolve to cyclonic storm from cyclonic storm if it has to become a super cyclone 
okay if it has to become a super cyclone then you have to call it as wind speed that is greater than 220 kilometers per hour okay so this is what is happening at Tej, as I told you, is already reached an extremely severe cyclonic storm. That is, it has already gone up to 160 km per hour. Whereas Bay of Bengal, the depressions are yet to evolve to become a cyclone. Okay. However, this is a rare phenomena where both Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea are seeing cyclonic storms together. Okay. Now, this is more or less about it, this article. So, I hope you got an understanding of what this article was talking about. Okay, the next time when you hear about depressions or cyclonic storms, you should know the exact difference between the two terms. Okay, let us go to the next issue of the day. The next issue of the day is restoring ecological health of the Himalayas. Okay, basically the Supreme Court, okay, the Supreme Court has called on to tell or ask the, uh, you know, union government regarding assessment of carrying capacity of 13 states and UT which constitutes the Himalayan states. Again, every bit of information is important. They can ask you how many states are, you know, considered as Himalayan states in India. Okay. So, you should have a very good idea about these numbers because of late factual information are also very important because with the change in trend, there is no more elimination in a way where you can use your common sense to eliminate. You should have a proper sense of facts also. Okay. So, whenever I am talking about some facts, you should have a very good eye over it. Okay. Anyways, the Supreme Court has asked about the assessment of carrying capacity of 13 states and UTs in the Himalayan states. Okay, so basically it is talking about what is uh, the government doing regarding the recent environmental devastation that is happening in Himalayas. Okay, so what are the environmental devastation that is happening in Himalayas? One, Himachal Pradesh saw flash floods, Uttarakhand saw cloud burst, Sikkim saw glacial lake outburst floods look at this this has been a huge impact of climate change in the indian himalayan region can we say that the impact of climate change on indian himalayan region okay now with this we can conclude telling that indian himalayan region is becoming more and more vulnerable and more and more fragile with that, the Supreme Court has asked the government what they are doing in order to assess the carrying capacity, to assess the carrying capacity of this Indian Himalayan region. To define what is the carrying capacity, carrying capacity is the maximum population that a region can sustain, the maximum population that a region can sustain without any arm or degradation to the environment or ecosystem in that region. Let me repeat this. The maximum population that a region can sustain without any arm or degradation to the environment or ecosystem in that region is known as carrying capacity. So, the Supreme Court has also asked about this carrying capacity assessment that was promised by the union government in January of 2023. So, it is asked or seek the reply because understanding the carrying capacity is very important. One thing what we should, we should know is in the Indian Himalayan states or Indian Himalayan region, the carrying capacity of the region, the carrying capacity of the region is already exceeded. So, when the carrying capacity is already exceeded, then the environment is automatically undergoing degradation as well as devastation. So, it is very very pertinent to understand the carrying capacity of the Indian Himalayan region. The best case study is Joshi Mutt. The sinking of Joshi Mutt, one of the main reason is it has exceeded its carrying capacity uh, in that particular region. Okay. Anyways, now the Supreme Court has not only asked the Union government regarding the carrying capacity assessment, but it is also told, look at this, to involve the local population or grassroots bodies. It is also told to involve the local uh, population as well as grassroots bodies in determining the carrying capacity of Indian Himalayan region. 
So it should not be done just as a scientific assessment. It should not be done just as a physical exercise, but it should also have social dimensions. That is what is the, uh, you know, uh, the suggestion given by the Supreme Court. Now, as the question is asked, the union government has answered it. The union government has said that it is formed a group and the group constitutes the members or nominees from all these institutes. Now, knowing the location of these institutes are important from prelims perspective. They may not ask you in mains about these institutes, but knowing about them and their location in prelims perspective is very, very important. See, these are the important institutes that uh, the government has cited. So it has told the director, the director of GB Pant Institute, National Institute of Himalayan Environment. Okay, the director of GB Pant National Institute of Himalayan Environment. This uh, body, the director of this body will head the committee. And this committee will be in charge of carrying out the carrying capacity assessment okay this body will be in charge of uh, you know carrying out the carrying uh, capacity assessment now along with this director who will be heading out this committee there will be other technical support group to support this committee and these technical support group will come from all the following institutes okay these following institutes will nominate few members who are going to be considered within the committee who will help the main committee in assessing the carrying capacity as i told you the location of these institutes are important the first is the national institute of disaster management in bhopal the second is the national institute of hydrology in roorkee the third is indian institute of remote sensing in dehradun the fourth is national environmental engineering research institute nagpur the four, fifth is Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology, Dehradun. The sixth is Indian Council of Forestry Research and Education, Dehradun. And the last is Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. They can either give you in the massive following of institutes and different places, or they can just ask you a statement telling this institute in this location is doing so and so. Okay, so you should have a very good idea about these locations. Okay, now uh, a question for you people to post in the comment section is where is GB Panth National Institute of Himalayan Environment located? Put this in the comment section. Okay. However, this committee will be assessing the carrying capacity of the Indian Himalayan region, which has become a very pertinent issue because the impact of climate change is very widely felt in the Indian Himalayan region. The case study of Joshimut, as well as the recent environmental devastation that is happening in Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and Sikkim, is very widely telling about the impact of climate change, which is going to be exponentially high in the Himalayan states. Okay. So this completes this issue. Now, some of the initiatives that are taken regarding the overall development of Indian Himalayan region are one, you have National Mission for Sustaining Nash, uh, Himalayan Ecosystem. This NMSHE, National Mission uh, for Sustaining Himalayan Ecosystem, this comes under one out of eight missions under National Action Plan for Climate Change. Okay, it comes as one of the eight missions of National Action Plan on Climate Change. This is basically there in order to understand in order to understand the impact of climate change on Himalayan ecosystems. Okay, now to understand the impact of climate change in Himalayan ecosystem, you need to have scientific knowledge. Correct. So science is very important to understand the impact of climate change on Himalayan ecosystem. Plus, you need technology to mitigate the effects of to mitigate the effects of climate change on Himalayas. That is why this mission because it requires the scientific knowledge to understand and technology to mitigate the effects. This mission comes under Ministry of Science and Technology. Okay. The next program is the Indian Himalayas Climate Adaptation Program. Okay. This is a bilateral program. Okay. And this is a framework agreement on science and tech that was done between Switzerland and India okay so this is what is a bilateral this is a bilateral program between Switzerland and India okay and uh, this is a framework agreement on SNT to understand the climate adaptation in Himalayan region okay the next is secure Himalayan project okay secure Himalayan project is important because it comes or it is under Ministry of Environment and Climate Change the next is this comes under a much more wider program called Global Wildlife 
program okay now this global wildlife program is a short uh, short form for much more wider program it can be called as global wildlife program i'm giving you both the versions because upsc can talk or play with both the versions okay it comes under global wildlife program or that global wildlife program is also called as global partnership uh, on wildlife global partnership on wildlife con convention conservation sorry wildlife conservation and crime prevention for sustainable development see when they give you this alternate name you will get confused usually in the books you would have read it comes under global wildlife program but the global wildlife program is a short form for a much more wider name that is called as global partnership on wildlife conservation and crime prevention for sustainable development so secure himalaya project comes under this program okay it is executed or implemented by ministry of environment and climate change and uh, this particular global wildlife program or the global partnership on wildlife conservation is sponsored by global environmental facility fund gef okay and what is the main objective the main objective is to protect alpine pastures and high altitude forest so basically the idea is to protect alpine pastures as well as high altitude forests now how do i protect uh, uh, alpine pastures or high altitude forest by protecting the species that make use of this high alpine and high altitude forest so the species that makes use of this is the global i mean the snow leopard so within the secure himalaya project you have global snow leopard conservation program why do you conserve snow leopard in this program because by conserving snow leopard you are also conserving the alpine pastures as well as the high altitude forests okay so this is what is the secure himalaya project and the last is what we have discussed that is the carrying capacity of india himalayan region that is what this issue is mostly talking about the carrying capacity assessment is still to be done and the committee is being set up with the director of gb pant national institute of himalayan environment being the head of the committee who is going to assess the carrying capacity of the indian himalayan region so this is what is the entire article about as you know indian himalayan region is repeatedly coming in news so there will be a lot of questions from mains as well as prince perspective coming from this particular issue so please make sure that you are very very well prepared in this region okay the last issue of the day is there is 65% drop in terrorism lwe and north east insurgency says the union home minister okay which is a good news okay as you know uh left wing extremism is nothing but an insurgency that is purely based on ideology and the ideology comes from moism or moist okay that's what that's what uh, they are calling as uh mao or the ideology comes from mao hence it is this ideology is known as moism so a left wing extra, uh, extremism is also an insurgency based on ideology whereas northeast insurgency is basically based on ethnic differences in both this in both this insurgencies it involves violence at in and it involves overthrow of legitimate elected government okay it is it involves violence as it involves overthrow of legitimate elected government hence both are illegal okay along with this as you know there is terrorism this is usually state sponsored and they usually uh, you know attack uh, civilian uh, places in order to disrupt the civilian activities and this is mainly done in jammu and kashmir okay so basically the home minister tells that countries three hot spots you can use this in your answers countries three hot spots especially the lw hit states that is the red corridor in the eastern part of india the next is the northeast which is insurgency hit and the last is jammu kashmir these are the three hot spots one is lwe another is northeast insurgency another is terrorism terrorism afflicted these three hot spots have seen 65% decline in their uh, you know uh, disruptions and have returned to peace and marching towards prosperity okay as you know internal security in your gs3 is very important you can use this in that particular paper because it is being cited by the union home minister himself okay now the union uh, home minister also talks about the modernization of police reforms scheme and in that the home minister has cited the police technology mission is helpful in creating the world's best anti terrorism 
force the world's best anti terrorism force okay now what is this modernization of police scheme the modernization of police scheme was introduced in 2021 it's a five year program that runs from 2021 to 2026 okay now because police is again a state subject not all states have implemented this modernization in a uniform manner however these are some of the components of modernization of police forces scheme okay one is the police technology mission this means that you adopt modern technology to fight any type of illegal activities that is what is police technology mission the next is the focus will be on specific areas and states now these are the hot spots which the home minister has spoken about the next is setting up of forensic forensics are very important in order to make sure that the crime scene is properly investigated and the prosecution will have a very solid case to make sure the criminals are convicted okay the next is upgrading infrastructure the next is strengthening our criminal justice system now as you know the criminal justice system and how poor our criminal justice system was evident in our nitari case uh, in the supreme court i'm sorry in the allahabad high court i'm really sorry the nitari case pointed out that our criminal justice system is having very high loopholes so strengthening criminal justice system which involves the three actors we have the police we have the prisons and then we have the judiciary so strengthening all the three are very important for the criminal justice system to be robust to make sure that our conviction rates increases however in this the police plays a very important role in creating a solid case for that all the other things within the modernization of police reforms is very very important and finally we have the narcotics control so all these are different components in modernization of police forces scheme amongst them the police technology mission has been widely successful especially in these three hotspots that is the northeast insurgency the lwe that's left wing extremism as well as the terrorism in jammu and kashmir this has resulted in building the best anti terrorism police force in in, uh, in the world is what our union home minister has cited okay so these are the issues of today i hope it was very helpful and uh, thank you for tuning in i understand that it is a festival season and i would like to wish to all the viewers happy ayudha puja today ayudha puja is basically the celebration or you are trying to uh, you know appreciate the tools and how those tools have helped you in achieving your goals as a student the main tools of yours is pen and your books appreciate these pen, these two tools and make sure that you always treat them with highest amount of gratitude and highest amount of appreciation if you do that the returns that you get from the book and the pen will be tremendous okay so uh, happy ay the puja to all my viewers i hope that you will be able to find the goal that you're searching for as soon as possible and also happy vijayadashmi in advance as i told you vijayadashmi is where a good will overcome evil and i hope each and every individual is constantly fighting within themselves with good and evil you should able you should be able to overcome your evil with the help of the good qualities okay we cannot completely remove the evil but there will always be a constant tussle when which the vijaya dashmi should always be the good defeating the evil so it is always a competition not with others but it's always a competition within ourselves to always compete and win and make sure the win is always towards the good defeating the evil so with that i give uh, i i take my ado i again wish all my viewers happy ayudha puja today and happy vijaya dashmi tomorrow in advance thank you guys see you tomorrow please like share and subscribe this video if you like and if you feel that this videos are helping you in your endeavor of current affairs as well as upsc preparation see you tomorrow guys bye